All right, how are we doing? Well, my name is Chris Plug and Pull, and I am so glad that you are here today. I'm one of the pastors here on Sap Wells Branch Community Church. And um, did you know, you guys ready for this, that this is the second to last Sunday that we will be in the rec center? And that is especially important because this morning, as I uh, came in, there was like a tractor trailer parked in the parking lot of the rec center that like took up the entire parking lot and that was a little frantic moment for me. And then there's, I think there's actually bulldozers uh, parked in different spots out here and you're just like, what's that all about? Well, they're, they're building a skate park like right next door to us, which I'm all for skate parks. But Sunday morning, really? Anyway, uh, so, uh, that, so that sort of frustration is gonna be like minimized as we get our own space. Aren't you guys excited about that? I mean, we've been talking about this for like forever. Like, really forever. And so May 6th is sort of like, um, we call it Family Sunday because, it, you know, when family comes over and your house is a complete disaster and you didn't, like, sweep and mop and dust or anything, you know that nobody's going to judge you. Just go, it's because it's family. Just walk in the back door or through the garage or something. And then May 20th is when we're going to have stuff together. Does that make sense? That's sort of like when we're, we'll have like all the final painting done and like everything looking really fun and awesome. And that's like the open house for everybody. And we'll be really, really, really excited. Uh, so, but May 6th, if you're comfortable with family, like you consider yourself like I'm in, like we're family, like we know each other that well, then you're coming May 6th. And then if you're like, um, I need it to be perfect for to show up May 20th is more of when you would show up. Okay. And then even then don't judge us because you never know what's going to look like on May 20th. All right. <laughs> so speaking of new things, uh, you know, you know uh, how many military people do I have here? People have served at some point. Okay, good. Uh, I, I, I went to the army uh, back in, man, 1995. Can you believe it? Was, like, that is like, whoa. That was a different millennia. All right. So, uh, but when I went, um, I had literally no idea. I went to West Point uh, because of some recruiter that showed me like a, you know, a, a trifold that had pictures of cadets with swords and then soldiers with guns. And I was like, so I get to wear a sword? And they're like, yeah, yeah, when you're a senior, you wear a sword. I'm like, sign me up. Didn't ask another question, never researched a thing. You know, I, 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 you know I've seen movies before, so clearly I already knew what, what the Army was about. People were a little bit, you know, they, had, they would yell a little bit. And I thought, what? I can handle yelling. You know, I, was, I played varsity sports. I know, I can, like, I can do shuttle runs. I can, like, do drills. Like, whatever you got, I can do it. And so um, when I show up, I'm not making this up. They have this, like, they give you, like, a, a full minute. They, they say, you have 60 seconds to say goodbye to your parents. And I'm like, I don't need 60 seconds. See you later, guys. And I'm, like, walking off, and, like, everybody is crying. Like, literally, like, moms are crying. Like, the cadet, like, the new candidate cadets are crying. I mean, they're all, like, bawling their eyes out. I'm like, what a bunch of wussies. What is going on here? Like, clearly, I'm a cut above, right? And so I just walk in, and like I'm like, hey, how you doing? I'm here. And they're like, you, shut your mouth, stand right there. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, I, had, I mean, like, like, did not know a thing. And uh, in fact, we had to memorize, like, a ton, they call it, like, plebe knowledge. So plebe is like a freshman. And you had to memorize a litany. I mean, a massive list of stuff. Uh, one of them was like Schofield's definition of discipline, which was written in 1879. All right, so it went something like this. The, the discipline which makes the soldiers of free country reliable in battles not to be gained by harsh or tyrannical treatment. On the contrary, such treatment is far more likely to destroy than to make an army. It's possible to impart instruction, give commands, such a manner, such a tone of voice as to inspire in the soldier no feeling but intense desire to obey, while the opposite manner and tone of voice cannot fail to excite strong resentment and desire to disobey. The one mode the other of dealing with support and its corresponds with with the corresponding spirit within the breast of the commander, he who feels and uh, the respect which is due to others cannot fail to inspire in them regard for himself, while he who he feels enhanced manifest disrespect towards others, especially his subordinates, cannot fail to inspire hatred against himself. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, so, yeah, still got it, still got it. So that was, that was one of like a thousand things that I didn't even know about, all right? And like all these other guys are like just rattling off that and like the definition of leather and like, every thing of the army. And I, I didn't even know what the ranks were. I, like, I was like, what's the difference between like a sergeant and a 
a captain. Like, had no idea. I had no clue. And so that made uh, cadet basic training and my first, you know, on-ramp into the military very, 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 with a capital V, E-R-Y, painful. I may or may not have shed a lot of tears during that time, okay? And uh, in fact, I was like, Kenneth, are you crying? I'm like, <laughs> my contact. <laughs> I don't even know if we were allowed to wear contacts, but that's what I said. Anyway, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was a painful time. And I, the reason why I bring that up is there's a lot of us here that are new Christians. Like you're just like, you're brand new or you're, you, you had a lot of baggage coming into Christianity and you're kind of like starting over here and we're so glad you're here. Like we are grateful for wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Um, we love to help you take the next step. But when it comes to church stuff and specifically the Holy Spirit, there's several backgrounds that you have, okay? I mean, we are, I mean, especially in America where we have like every version of Christianity around. So when I say Holy Spirit, uh, for some of you, uh, it's more like uh, the genie, right? You, you know the Holy Spirit. He is a genie and you rub the magic lamp and uh, he comes out and then he asks what your wishes are. And you say, I would like, you know, the new car, the new house, and the better job. I want my kids to shut up. You know, whatever it is. And like the Holy Spirit works for you, okay? And um, <clears throat> in fact, maybe in some of the churches you went, you ended up with gold dust on your palms after you worship because the Holy Spirit was there. And to get the Holy Spirit to work, you because the Holy Spirit's a little hard of hearing in this realm. And so you have to yell a lot. A lot of yelling gets the Holy Spirit to work. The louder you yell, the harder he works. And then if you get it right, it's all about like just conjuring up enough faith, enough emotion, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit goes, whoa-bam, and he starts doing stuff for you, all right? Uh, and then there's other people that sort of have uh, this version of the Holy Spirit, and he's kind of the clip art version, all right? He's not very interesting. Uh, he is a, he, I mean, listen, he's there for doctrine, and he is, some, he is some propositional prepositions that you can put on a piece of paper, and he looks good on text, and man, you can memorize some creeds, Athanasian Creed, man, that just, that's some sweet work. Uh, or the Nicene Creed, and he is ancient and doctrined, and uh, he's not very trendy, uh, but, you know, he gets out of your way. And so what happens is, is that those are like the two extremes of when it comes to the Holy Spirit. And what I think we miss out, because we're ignorant, and, and you know, for some of us, Ignorance is up, bliss up until you need something, right? I, it was great for me to not have a, listen, everybody else crying uh, going into West Point, and I'm just like, uh, it was that time, there was no stress. I had zero anxiety, none, like had no anxiety whatsoever. Everyone's like, are you really worried about West Point? I'm like, nope, because ignorance is bliss. But ignorance becomes painful when you need to interact or need help. And so I think for us as Christians, we come into this and listen, do we need help? We need help. Because living the Christian life is impossible without him. And so I want us to learn what it is to interact with the Holy Spirit. And so this morning we're going to be in Acts chapter 1. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, would you raise your hand and wave it in the air, wave it like you do care, and a Bible will come to you. If you don't have a Bible at all, this is our gift to you. But if you forgot yours and just want to leave it on the chair when you're done, we love that too. We just want everyone to interact with God's Word this morning. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 1. All right, that's on page 909, by the way, in the Bibles we passed out. So last week, Pastor Phil talked about Jesus hanging out with the disciples before he ascends, like physically floats off into heaven. And uh, everyone's sort of staring up in the clouds going, I wonder when he's coming back. And then angels appear and say, what are you guys doing? He'll, you know, get to work. Uh, he'll send the Holy Spirit and you're going to get ready for it. So they go and get ready. And that's where we pick up the story. Acts chapter 1, verse 12 then they, and the they is uh, the apostle, the disciples, everyone that's sort of been following Jesus around for 40 days after he rose from the dead. They returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet. So if the Mount of Olives, that's where Jesus was betrayed. Okay, so that's where it's, 
that's where they went, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room. Remember the upper room? That's where they had the Last Supper, so same place, where they were staying. And then Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James. And he lists off the 11 remaining apostles. Remember, Judas uh, took his own life. Uh, He betrayed Jesus. He's out. And so now you've got these guys. They're now going to wait for the Holy Spirit. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. So we see that like kind of the very first thing the early church did was they, they started meeting regularly to pray together, which is what you would assume people would do. And then... It, it gives like a list of the people that were with him. And I, this to me, I, this isn't the main point, but I just thought it was interesting. Together with the women, which you'd think Mary, the mother of Jesus, would be associated with the women, but they're not. The women, actually, we find out from, so do you know the Acts is part two of Luke's? So Luke is, is the is the for part one, and Acts is Luke part two, okay? And so in Luke 23, we found out the women are Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women. So there's a bunch of women here, but these are the women, the ones that discovered Jesus' tomb was empty. They kind of got special treatment. And whenever you see a list of stuff, in general, it goes in order of importance. And so the women come before Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now this is just, listen, I I don't know what background you come from, but I want you to notice that nobody's asking Mary to pray for them. They're not going, hey, Mary, I know you got an in with Jesus. You know, you did the nursing thing. There's a whole bunch of icons with you, you know, in in Jesus and the son and raising him up. Uh, Could you talk to Jesus for us because you got an in with him? They're not doing it. They're talking, they're asking, they're going to God directly because there's the, the perfect intercessor of Jesus who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead and they have, we have access to God through him. And so what, listen, if you're ever wondering how this whole praying to Mary thing came about, about 500 AD, um, that's when the dark ages started and the word of God became less and less preached or known. And so Jesus seemed like this high off figure. And so Mary seemed like someone that you could really get in touch with. She just seemed like way more loving. And, but then Mary, she kind of was really high up there. So you go to Anne. Anne was Mary's mom. And so you talk to Anne, Mary's mom, to talk to Mary, to talk to Jesus, to get your prayers answered, okay? And so there was a lot of middlemen that came in really from the 550. In fact, the Pope just sort of went with it after a while, like 600 something. Uh, They, praying and venerating Mary, became part of religious ritual that you would do. So good news for us, we can talk straight to Jesus. And as we see here, nobody is asking Mary to talk to Jesus for them. She's just one of the people praying alongside uh, the apostles and disciples. Now, this next one I thought was really even funnier. And his brothers. Do you know who the brothers of Jesus are? So there's a book of the Bible named after one of them, James. You know James, like if you turn to the way end, James. That's Jesus' oldest brother, or youngest, younger oldest brother. So whenever Jesus dies on the cross, he's raised from the dead, he made physical appearances to different people. And James, his oldest younger brother, was one of them. And you could imagine what that was like. James, what's up? I'm God. You know, uh, and, and you know, they thought he was crazy. They kept trying to pull Jesus. And, you know, he'd have meetings with the disciples. They're like, Jesus, we need to take you to a special place where the people who think they're God live. And they have really nice padded rooms and a lot of people dressed in white. It's almost like heaven. You know, like they were kind of trying to get him to kind of come away with them. And, and Jesus is like, you know, who are my brothers, my sisters, my mother? They're the ones who do the will of God. And they were kind of shunned in that moment. But here James is like, Joke's on me. You really are the son of God. All right. So they're all meeting together. And the apostles, I want to think this this is important. The apostles waited on the Holy Spirit by devoting themselves to prayer. Now this is important. This is important. Because, well, I'm going to speak for myself. I'm not a waiter. Like I stink at waiting. Like, I like showing up early to places. Like, if we have a meeting, now listen, I won't go into your office before the exact time, but I'll sit in the, because that's rude. 
Okay. All right. All right. What I'm going to do, I'm going to sit in the parking lot until about one minute before, and then I walk in, and bam! All right, I'm not going to take up your waiting room space. I'm going to be there right at the exact time. Okay? Because I don't like waiting, and I know you don't like waiting, and I want you waiting on me, but I don't want to be any, I want to make sure that I'm prepared and plan. All right, listen. I like being in places early. I like things happening when I think of them. And that um, is challenging because I think a lot of our culture is designed that way. And then I get married to somebody that <clears throat> in general doesn't think like that. I don't, is anybody like an on-time person married to a not on-time person? That never causes conflict, ever. Like, every, like it's just always like wonderful joy and bliss whenever you kind of hang out with them. Anyway, so, uh, so there I am, uh, married, and, and so I get this beautiful gift of being sanctified by my wife. Do you guys know what sanctification, since we're talking about new things, Christians learn new language, sanctification is being set apart for God's purpose to be refined. And so God gave me the gift of my wife who doesn't believe in time. And uh, so that helps me understand how to wait. And so, and then awesome, what's also awesome, the Holy Spirit is trying to teach teach me something about I, he's not my genie. He doesn't just, when I snap my fingers, he doesn't start, you know, voila. And that's hard for me. So can I, can I share this with you, especially for somebody that was going into ministry. When I, when I was um, about, uh, I just graduated from seminary. I just gotten married. And uh, let's go back, let's take us back to 2011. And so 2011, Adrian and I were living in an apartment complex uh, with, in the, that same complex was our missionary, who's now our missionary in Tanzania, James and Didi Meyer. We were all living in Dallas together. And we were all, uh, you know, thinking what our futures would be. And Holland Greg lived about uh, a mile away. And his girlfriend at the time, Jenny and Holland, and then Katie Vineyard, who would become Katie Foster, uh, would all come over to our apartment every Tuesday. And we would pray because I knew God had called me uh, to ministry specifically to the church. And I didn't know what that meant. I just knew without, and I said, and I told Holland and James, if you guys hang with me, I will, we will do ministry together and I will send you out. I promise. I'm not just, you know, I don't want to just use you. I want to send you. And so they would come and every Tuesday we would say, God, where would you have us? Where would you have us? Where would you have us? And that was like in April. And we would pray that. In a every week in April, every week in May, every week in June, every week in July, August. I mean, it felt like forever, especially when you're waiting to do what God has called you to do and you feel like he's called you, you know, something very specific like be a pastor and then you got people who want to do that with you. It's very hard not to just start, but wait on the Lord's timing. Now, at that time, um, I was living in Dallas, like I said, and um, Adrian and I had come down, we were talking to Hill Country Bible Church, UT. It was on the UT campus. I'd done college ministry. I knew college kids. I was cool back then. And, um, and so I would, I would we, we went there and I spoke at Hill Country UT. And I'm thinking they're going to like offer me like a package deal and like all this amazingness. And then they didn't. And I was like, all right, that clearly wasn't from God. All right, waiting, waiting. Anybody ever wait like this? You, you know, you're in between jobs, waiting. <laughs> waiting. Okay. So then um, in August of 2011, across my email comes uh, this notification that the pastor uh, who planted Wells Branch Community Church passed away. So if you don't know that, uh, Todd Wortham uh, planted this church in, 2000, in September of 2009. And so in August of 2011, not even two years into it, he passed away. And so I get an email about that. And then a couple days later, uh, my resume gets sent out, just on auto send out by my seminary, to uh, Danny Box, who's the pastor at Hill Country Bible Church Pflugerville, who was hiring the, the pastor that would replace Todd. And in that moment, I was like, I wonder if I should call Danny. Ah, it might be a little weird. It might be a little bit forward to kind of call when, you know, they're just kind of going through death and that whole process. And I was like, man, what do I do? What do I do? So I, I got my phone out. And, you know, you can do the trusty thing where you can set an alarm for your phone, right? You know, because that's the only thing I could do at the time. And so I go, uh, I set an alarm for November 15th, 2011, call Danny Box. All right, I'm going to call Danny. I'm going to give it two months or so, and I'm going to call him. So uh, we continue praying. We continue waiting. We're praying and waiting, praying and waiting. And um, Adrian and I come down to visit her, her parents who live in uh, West Austin. And so we go over there, and it, I'll never forget, it was a Monday, and um, my uh, phone starts beeping. And I go, oh, call Danny Box. I said, you know what? 
I should probably call Danny Box today. That, that my alarm was set for this day. I've been, you know, praying about it. Today's the day I'm going to call him. And then about five minutes after I kind of announced that to Adrian's parents and Adrian, my phone rings. I look down, and it's Danny Box. Now, I'd never met Danny Box. Uh, I, like, you know, it, it was one of those really random, weird things that I somehow, you know, th- and so I, Danny, I'm like, hello, and it's Danny. And he's like, hey, Chris, uh, my name's Danny Box. I'm the pastor of Hill Country Bible Church, Fulgerville. Got your resume, blah, blah, blah. And I was wondering if you could, you know, we could talk about it. I was like, well, I'm actually, I just happened to be in Austin today. <laughs> and so we went to the, the Cafe 620, which is on 620. All right, so we, we had, had breakfast over there. And uh, he's like, so what do you think about being... Uh, the pastor here, and I was like, ah, you know, I, I definitely am praying for that, and that would be really cool. And then, two months after that, I became the pastor of Wells Branch Community Church, which was an exciting thing for me. Now, but but in that time, it was a lot of gathering for prayer. It was a lot of like, God, would you direct me? Because, listen, I didn't care if I, I got to preach in uh, Austin or in New York. Now, Adrian was against anything that had like winters of snow. So that kind of limited our, to the lower half. Anyway, so we, but, but during that time, it was this process where God, we're waiting for you to act. I need your Holy Spirit to work. And so through those crazy circumstances, it was out without a shadow of doubt that this is the place that God had called me to be. And it was, it was an exciting time. Now, I want you to see this, that it's, when, when you're waiting, you're not just sitting on your hands. Do you guys know that? This, this is the good news. Like, because, you know, the, here's the thing about uh, waiting. You know who was really great at wa- waiting? Like, champions at it. When we go to Africa, it is awesome. They are the best waiters of all time. If you have a lunch meeting with somebody, it's, any, it's lunch. There's no time on it. It's anywhere between 11 and 3. And here's the thing. If you show up at 11 and you're waiting, um, you're getting impatient, but but in Africa, nobody's getting impatient. They're just hanging out. They're just present in the moment. They're just enjoying the sun going up and down and all sorts of birds are singing. And they're just enjoying the thing. Whereas me, I'm panicking, okay? Like so, so like, and so, but I, I really feel like that, that was a gift. But I feel like there, I love how God offends every culture everywhere because what God is saying to do whenever he is uh, calling you to wait, he's not saying sit on your hands and just stare. So watch this. In those, Peter, in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of person was in all about 120. So he kind of grown from the 11 plus the women plus Mary plus the brothers. And said, brothers, <clears throat> the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David. Now I want you to think this. I want you to, concerning Judas. The Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas. Judas and David live a thousand years apart. I want you to think about that. The Holy, as Peter is searching the scripture, he's reading the scripture and it's going to talk about Judas, who is not even in the time dimension reality of the author, but clearly the Holy Spirit is speaking. Now, here's the other thing about the Holy Spirit. Did you know that the Holy Spirit didn't just come about in the New Testament? The Holy Spirit has been part of the Godhead since forever, like was part of creation. The Holy Spirit's been working in and through his people for ever. Now watch, the Holy Spirit spoke before him by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now, this is what I love about uh, Luke. He's going to go in to explain exactly who Judas was, just in case you weren't following. Now this man, Judas, acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open the middle and all his bowels gushed out. Keep moving. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, Al-Kadama, Al-Kaldama, which is field of blood. So you get that quick little parenthetical about Judas and we, we've talked in depth about uh, Judas' suicide uh, and you can go a couple messages back and hear all about it. Let's go to verse 20. For it's written in the book of Psalms. So going back to David, David wrote, the, wrote a lot of the Psalms, and specifically these two Psalms that he's going to reference. May his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it. That's Psalm 69, verse 25. And, and let another take his office. Psalm 109, verse 8. Now, did you know that Peter did not have a Bible that looked like this? 
because the Gutenberg press wasn't invented until like the 16-somethings, right? All right, or 15-somethings, get my history right. All right, so there is no Bible with a handy carrying case. The Bible probably would have taken up this entire stage and then some, like rolled up scrolls. I mean, these are massive things, huge things. So when we talk about this, Peter wasn't breaking out his copy of the scrolls. Nobody had a copy of the scrolls. You know what Peter was doing? He was going uh, to temple every day, and then he'd go to, to pray. And at the temple, the, did you know that they would go through the Psalms, every single Psalm, monthly? So when he would hear God's word, they would read it through or sing it through, and he would hear as they go all the way through Psalm 69, and it would just kind of impress upon his heart, and it was just something would resonate. The Holy Spirit would speak to him as he was at the temple, and they're, they're reading, singing Psalm 69. And the title of Psalm 69 is, Help Me, O Lord. The title of Psalm 109 is, Save Me, O God. It's, it's just a cool thing where these salvific prayer titles that David wrote, which were messianic in nature in the sense that they were predicting Jesus. And as Peter is listening, he's looking for where Jesus appears in the scripture, looking to interact. He's been praying. He's been waiting. He's looking for an interaction of God's Holy Spirit because where else do you look for God to speak to you but God's word? A lot of us, remember we've said this, we've said this. A lot of you want to hear God's voice. And I say, read God's word. If you want to hear God's voice out loud, read God's word out loud. That's a great way to do it. And so here it is. He's, he's interacting with the scripture. And all of a sudden, here's what the Holy Spirit does. Do you guys know this? When you read God's word, the Holy Spirit speaks to you from behind the text and illuminates certain things to resonate with your spirit. You know how I know this? You guys already do this. You guys already do this. Um, <clears throat> where are my single people at? Can I just get a whoop or something like that? All right. Okay, whoop. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was not that exciting. All right, listen, it's, would you enjoy your signalist for crying out loud? You have no idea how good your life is. Okay, um, all right. <laughs> all right, so check it out, check it out. Listen, you know, but you know the exciting thing is like when you're dating? You guys, you guys remember this? Or like, or like when you like somebody and you're not sure if they like you. Yet, can you guys remember this? And you text, you're texting, right? And you're going... And you get the text from her or from him, and there's, a, there's an emoji. And you're trying to decipher what the emoji means. It's like, it's a smiley face. And, and then that's when you go, oh, no, it's just a smiley. It's not a laugh. It's, there's no teeth showing. And then what you do is you get all your friends around and you're like, what does it mean? Right? Okay, and you're inter the reason why you're doing that is you're interacting, you're interacting with the words, but there's somebody on the other side of the words. So when you interact with, with, they're just words. They're just words. But the reason why you try and figure out what it means is there's somebody on the other side of the words who loves you and is very interested in you and has a really specific plan for you your life. That's why you get into God's word because this text opens up and when you come in expectation the Holy Spirit has a word for you, then what happens is it, it gets you like, what are you trying to say to me, God? What are you trying to say to me? And that's, so as Peter is listening, he's like, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to say to me? And then it hits him Verse 21, so the men who have accompanied us during all the time that Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. So he's saying, we're going to fill the spot that Judas left, and that guy is going to be who's with us from John the Baptist, his baptism of Jesus, all the way up until now. And he's going to be a witness to the resurrection. Now listen, it's not a witness to his teachings. It's not a, Jesus had this really sweet thing called the golden rule. Man, it's awesome. It's going to change the world. Uh, he had this way of like positioning power and authority. You know, the, the last will be first, the first will be last. That's not what they were all, listen, we're going to be not witnesses to his teaching, but to the resurrection that Jesus came. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. And that was what they were all pumped up about. But here it is. The Holy Spirit spoke to Peter through God's word. 
And I was, I was trying to figure out how to best explain like how this happens uh, to you. And I have a real life example I wanna share with you. So, hey, Joe, CSTAT, would you mind coming? Joe's one of our pastors here with us at, at church. And um, I would love for Joe to be able to share with us just a, a qu- he's got a crazy announcement. And then through that crazy announcement, how has God revealed himself through his word um, what the next part of your life is like? Sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, Just to give you guys a little bit of context, you know, we've been here for two years. Uh, Coming here was a a really big deal for my wife and I and our family. We had four kids at the time, uh, left a kind of full-time career in Cleveland, Ohio, and the elders and Chris made an amazing way, and the Holy Spirit made an amazing way to bring us across the country to come here. And since we've been here, it's been amazing. When we moved in, We had people kind of working on our house ahead of time, unpacking bins, uh, welcoming us. The young adults and the young adult ministry for the well uh, welcomed us and our family open arms with Forge and other events that we did, Friday Volleyball. Uh, Since the time that we've been here, many of you have been able to, um, we've been able to share our lives with you. We've had uh, four of our kids out of six uh, receive Jesus Christ as Lord in the past two years and be baptized, uh, which has been just amazing. Yeah. And, and just being able to do that all with you, um, things like uh, men's retreats, forge retreats, everything has just been amazing. Um, marriages that we've had a chance to officiate and be very involved in premarital counseling and all that. Um, if it wasn't for God speaking to me very clearly through his word very recently, um, we, would, we would plan to be here for the rest of our lives. When and you I'll, say recently, like how recent? About nine months ago is, is um, where something became very clear. And, and um uh, the announcement is that we're going to be moving uh, to Michigan, which is my hometown, and we're going to move sometime this summer. And the reason why we're moving is to plant a church in my hometown, which is a very spiritually darkened place. Mm-hmm. And so how did, how did, I mean, even reading God's word, how did that even come about? I mean, that seems like such a strange thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Uh, I, I've had a few different Bible reading plans. The, the most recent couple have been to read straight through the Bible. You know, Old Testament, New Testament, not missing at all. And for me, that looks like probably an hour or so in the Word every day uh, with journaling and prayer time following that and, uh, and interacting with the Holy Spirit and God's Word. And so I had, uh, we, we were in Michigan at the time. We were on summer vacation in, in July. And I had been reading the Old Testament prophets. So I had read Isaiah and Jeremiah, and I was on Ezekiel, right at the beginning of Ezekiel. And I had, I had read these books before, and I had heard about, um, you know, uh, God using them and calling them to, to, to preach out a repentance against darkness and things like that. So I knew kind of coming into Ezekiel, sort of what to expect. I was gearing up for it, and sure enough, so I So it was, wasn't the first time you ever read it? It wasn't the first time I ever read Ezekiel. But one thing, that day, as I, it was like a Saturday in July, beginning of July, when I opened up the book of Ezekiel, and I started to look at the call that God placed on his heart for— for me, the word watchman hmm. stuck out in, in, uh, in chapter 2 and 3. The word watchman stuck out, and then God says in chapter 2 that he will speak with, he said, I will speak with you. And then he said that you're going to, he, he told Ezekiel, you're going to go back to your hometown. He was in exile, um, and he was going to come back to, to Israel, and, and you're going to preach repentance, and some people will not believe. Hmm. And so as those words started to roll across the scriptures, I, I can tell you that I, I felt a burden in my heart that just intensified. I knew it was from God. I knew it was from the author of the word of God. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it meant something yeah. a whole lot to me at that time. And so how did you like process that? Did you just go, hey, Renee, we're moving? Or what, <laughs> how, did that, how, did that, how did that work itself out? So I shared in my quiet time, I, I did share with her what came across that morning. And I said, I think that we should explore. And, you know, being a nice wife, she's like, okay, honey, you know. But, um, but so we were there. We started to look and pray in that area. But we were coming back here to a ministry that we love, people mm-hmm. that we love, and, uh, and also we were right in the middle of adopting two children. So we had <laughs> Daniel that came into our family right after that trip, uh, and then we had, uh, we had Danny that got to come from, from Ethiopia. So we had just a ton of life change, but I'll tell you, throughout that, um, I kept sharing with Renee what God was continuing to burden me. Like everything I read, it felt like started to affirm that. And then, and then feelings that I had started to affirm that. And, and it just was a, it was something that I knew was from him and it wouldn't go away. So, it was driving me that way. So does that mean that every time I read Ezekiel, that means I should pack up my family and move to my hometown? 
No, you know, um, I had read that verse several times before, and um, and I had been taught in seminary um, this idea of, of the watchman, the person, you know, that God would bring in a point that would stand out and look out for sin and warn the people, and I had heard that, and, and, and intellectually I understood it. Um, that time, though, God revealed in a very special way to mm-hmm. me uh, what that meant in my life at that time. So this was a specific word through the Holy Spirit that spoke to you, even though that was when when uh, Ezekiel wrote this, he wasn't thinking uh, Joe Seastat in 2018 <laughs> is going to move to uh, from Austin, Texas that didn't exist to uh, Michigan, a place that didn't exist. Right, right. The cool, yeah, exactly. It it, it was um, specific by the Holy Spirit. And the cool thing about Scripture and about God, the Holy Spirit, is that there were affirmations that would come along yeah. with that. As I started to look at the Scriptures, I started to really understand uh, what is God's heart as it pertains to the darkness and the lost and things like that. And so more as I would read through that perspective, knowing that he spoke to me through the word there, I would start to say, you know, he, he does have a heart for people who will go um, bravely, I guess, into the darkness and push it back. Yeah. And so I started to get more affirmation that way. Well, thanks so much, Joe, for sharing that with us. And can we just give it up for Joe for the way he served our church? And make sure at the end of today you give him a big hug. Because he doesn't know when he's moving, but it's going to be soon, right? Yeah, All right, man. Love you. All right, so there it is. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to Peter through God's word, illuminating his word, because there's a person on the other side of the text. Now, verse 23. And they put forward to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, which is probably really annoying when you're introducing him. And then Matthias. And they prayed. Now listen, look at the they. There's this call from Peter, and then they say, they uh, are, they put forward two. And here are the guys that have been, for, been with us since that time. Which one? Now watch this. And then you, Lord, they said, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. I can't think of anything more unspiritual than casting lots. Like, all right, flip a coin. Which one do you think? I mean, this is what I I love about that is that they didn't go, all right, Lord, I'm waiting for the light to shine on Matthias. Ready, go. And then Matthias lit up. It didn't happen like that. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, look at this. The Holy Spirit used those who waited on and trusted in him to launch his mission. Now, I want you to see this. This is is so important. The mission of God has a church. The church doesn't have a mission. Does that make sense? Because you're like, whoa, 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 no, the church has a, no, no, the, the church has a mission because the mission has a church. So the mission is first, and then the Holy Spirit gathers together the people he wants. And so it looks like this. Um, Here's what it looks like in real life, really real time. God as benefactor, God is in the control, God as sovereign king, has, has elders of this church. So elders, when I first heard that word elder, I was just thinking like, you know, 20-year-old Mormon guys with white, white shirts and uh, things. Elders is... A, is the term of leadership that the Bible uses. So God uses elders to lead this church. And did you know that in 2015, we had an opportunity to take on the roost? Did you guys know that? And the elders gathered together and we prayed and we were seeking God. We'd sit in the roost and we were like, I don't know how this is gonna happen. This, is, this seems like, it seems like it's the right thing. But at the time it was like we couldn't, it wasn't like God magically like illuminated uh, something and we were just like, aha. Or like somebody called and said, it won't be the roost until 2018. You know? No, it was the elders got together and we prayed and knowing that we're responsible uh, to God for this church and what his mission is, we said, we need to lay out a plan to get here and God will make a way. So at that time, there were the, the, the two spaces that we're going into were sort of vacant. And God said no at that time. And then during the time he said no, it kind of freaked me out. A live music venue comes in and then a, another church goes in. I was like, well, that's not going to be possible ever. Until we came about to this time, we started praying and said, God, what would you have us do? And that time we got financially placed to a place where we were ready. We got sanctified through that waiting. 
we got people like kind of focused. We planted a church in that time. And then um, the live music venue kind of went bankrupt and gave us all their stuff for like pennies on the dollar. So that kind of helped too. But I mean, like God set all of that up so that we would be ready at the right time because the elders are responsible to God and are looking to hear from him, interact with him. God, what would you have us do and hear from him through his word? And that's exactly what we did is we put our our church on a path to be able to be um, at the space we're at starting in two weeks, which is super exciting. So the the question I want to put forth to you guys Will you allow the Holy Spirit to use you to fulfill his purpose? Listen, everybody brings agendas to stuff, don't we? We I mean, nobody here doesn't have an agenda about something. And the thing that I'm so grateful for is that we come to God, and listen, we all bring our agendas because that's kind of who we are, but the Holy Spirit has an overriding one which will always supersede our personal desires, and if we are, have hearts that are willing and open to hear from him, he speaks to us and uses the collective wisdom of the people he's placed around you to help confirm that. And so this morning, I just want to ask this question. Will you allow the Holy Spirit to use you to fulfill his purpose? When I went to the army, um, remember, just pure green, had no clue about nothing. And Every day I would just try and figure out how to best serve, to serve my country, sort of. More like just get what I could to survive. I wanted to get accolades. I wanted to get little doodads on my uniform. Which then ultimately was the Army's way and the military's way and the government's way of, get it, of transforming me from civilian to warfighter. Now, what I want you to see is that God has a plan for his mission. And sometimes it feels like your little life is a microcosm of something completely out of this world that seems so confusing, so frustrating, and it causes you to wait. It causes you to rely on his word. But listen, listen. He speaks through his word. He illuminates his word. And something written thousands of years ago can still speak to you today because the person on the other side of the text is still alive. And so just as I was used for the government's mission, I'm now being used ultimately for God's mission, and so are you. If Jesus died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the dead, you now have a mission. He's asking you to join him on the mission of reaching people with the life-changing reality of Jesus Christ. And so my, my question and my heart for you is, will you allow the Holy Spirit to use you? Will you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you through his word? Will you allow the Holy Spirit to, to take normal situations and normal events to reveal his, his mission and reveal his purpose for your life? And if you're not a Christian here today, would you simply hear this? That Jesus wants heart, that that is the mission, you, to love you, to care for you in times of hurt and pain, and even when the darkness has sort of zeroed in in your life, and it's frustrating because things aren't fair, that Jesus came, he died on that cross, experienced the ultimate unfairness, and he rose from the dead so you could have life eternal and get something you didn't deserve, which was heaven and him. Would you pray with me? Father, um, this morning, would your word penetrate hearts? Would people come to believe in you that you died on the cross and rose to the dead? Holy Spirit, speak to somebody this morning about who you are and what you did for them. And Lord, would somebody come to believe in your son Jesus this morning and move from darkness to light to have eternity with you because of that faith? And God, I'm praying that as Christians, trying to discern what you would have for us, that we would take that next step of faith to interact with your word, to interact with the other person on the other side of the text. Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Would you illuminate your word? And would you allow us to follow and trust you doing even sometimes crazy things to serve your mission, to push forward your purpose as we follow you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.